Joining us now is the party's co-leader, Jonathan Bartley. Thanks very much for coming on the programme thank you. this morning. Um, before we get to your uh, offer, I just want to get your reaction to Jeremy Corbyn uh, at that uh, TV debate last night, uh, saying that if there was a second referendum, he would adopt a neutral position. Honestly, <laughs> I think people will look at that debate last night and think, is this the best we've got? You know, you've got someone, a prime minister who appears to be a racist and a liar. You've got uh, a leader of the opposition whose expertise seems to be in fence sitting, not just on this issue, but on a whole series of issues across the manifesto. And the Liberal Democrats trying to occupy the centre ground by riding roughshod over democracy. Hang on a minute. So why are you doing an alliance with the Lib Dems then? If you think they want to r ride roughshod over democracy, that's a pretty punchy claim. Why are you well, doing they, deals they, with they're, them? They're not going to form a government, let's be honest about that. We all know that's not going to happen. Uh, they are a Remain party. And on that particular issue, we agree with them. And we think the best way of moving forward as a country is having the biggest block of uh, Remain parties in the next parliament. I mean, it might not be a Tory majority, it might still be a hung parliament, and that would give us undue influence in order to get that people's vote uh, and campaign to remain in the European Union. So basically, remaining in the uh, EU trumps everything, even if you think they're riding roughshod over democracy? No, a people's vote is the way forward, is the route, because we need to think about also uniting the country, uh, learning to disagree well. But we are always and have always been passionately Remainers, because we believe that's one of the best ways of tackling the climate emergency. It's about protecting uh, the environmental protections that we run, the, envir the environmental rights, but also working with our neighbours who have also signed up to the Paris Agreement more closely. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, your offer on climate change, shall we? Because um, you, you say you want to spend £100 billion every year uh, tackling what you define as the climate emergency. I mean, it must be quite fun being a party of opposition. You can just promise what you want, can't you? £100 billion pounds a year? Well, no, I mean, look, look, you know, you're just having a, a discussion about where you get the money from. And mm -hmm. we were saying that, you know, borrowing is probably the most effective way you can raise money. Uh, you can do uh, tax changes. Uh, but there's another way which didn't really come up, and that's making the right choices about where you save. Now, all the other parties uh, are going to go ahead with HS2, right? Labour have actually said that now I think it's going to be up to £250 billion because they're going to extend it to Scotland. This is an environmentally destructive project. Now, that is two and a half years of our 10-year programme, £250 billion. They're all going ahead with Trident renewal. You know, that's going to be another £100 billion. So there's another year. Now, you know, we're not just saying uh, you need to borrow every single penny or indeed raise taxes. What we're saying is make the right choices, make the right environmental choices. Let's transform, let's restructure the economy. I just want to talk a little bit more about the economics of this, though, because I think people will have concerns about these really big ticket spending items. And just look at the IFS, for example. Uh, they believe that your proposals uh, will take borrowing to £140 billion. That's 6% of GDP, the highest level since the global crash. It would double the limit set by the EU's growth and stability pact. I mean, is that really responsible? Uh, we've, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures, and we know that we face a climate emergency. We know we're going to have to make this investment, but let's look at it historically. Uh, you can see Roosevelt's you know, two new deals. You can see the Marshall Plan. You can see what happened after the Second World War. Um, you know, these things, when you want a transformation of the economy, when you know you so, have to make it, you need to make those bold steps. Do you think it's compar comparable, then, the climate emergency to the, the World it, War II? It's, it's an existential threat. I mean, OK, 55 million people died in the Second World War. The threat of the climate emergency is much, much bigger than that. You know, there is no real bigger threat except, of course, nuclear weapons. Um, now, OK, so let's have a look at some of the uh, other policies in your manifesto in a bit more detail. We know, of course, you want to discourage flying. We know that there is clearly an environmental impact of flying. So you want to make domestic flights 20% more expensive by losing the VAT exemption and a frequent fly flyer levy for people who take more than one fly a year. Are you not a bit worried, though, that this is going to punish people who can't afford it? So if you're wealthy enough to visit your family abroad, you can do it as much as you want. But if you can't afford it, sorry, tough luck. What we know we have to do is re face up to the real cost of flying, which isn't just the financial cost of the uh, flyer levy, it's the massive, massive environmental cost. We're the only party that's saying, you know, let's take exp exp uh, airport expansion right off the table. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we have to set it at a rate that's going to work. We know that 70% uh, of the flights are taken by just 15% of the people. There is a binge flying uh, mentality amongst but primarily the super rich, you know, city airport, the average wage of someone who comes through there is about £120,000 a year. So why don't so you just we, cap it then rather than make it that money? Because a super rich can still fly as much as they want, can't well, they? Well, we feel that they need to pay their way uh, and we need to set it at a rate. You know, it will increase exponentially. So, you know, the first flight would be free, the second flight will go up a little bit more, third flight a little bit more than that, and then it will go up and up and up in much greater numbers. Uh, so we do need to clamp down and, and restrict that demand. And obviously it needs to be piloted and set at a level 
uh, where it is going to work and restrict that mm. super rich. How much responsibility is there on us as individuals to do more? Um, you've said that you've recently gone vegan, for example. I mean, do you have any kind of non-eco-friendly guilty pleasures that <laughs> you're yeah, trying well, to stop, but you can't, but can't the, I mean, the big it. thing we're saying is that it's got to be political change. Yeah, no, I drive a petrol car, but the reason I do it is because I have a son who's a wheelchair user. Our local station isn't accessible. You can't get on any buses. And if you can get on the tube at Brixton, you can't get off anywhere, you know, because the tube stations aren't accessible. Um, we need to make it possible for people to make the right choices. And just reducing it down to the personal level is not going to provide anywhere near the amount of change that we need. Mm -hmm. It has to be big, big, big change from the top, transitioning every sector of the economy. So we're cutting fares, so we're electrifying all the rails, we're putting on new bus routes, uh, we're making it easy for people to leave their cars behind and get decent public transport that works for everyone. Um, while we've got you, I'm interested to know about your opinion on a story that's been in the media a lot recently, which is um, that of Prince Andrew and um, his decision, of course, to give an interview on his friendship with the convicted sex offender, Jeffrey Epstein. Now, Jeremy Corbyn said this week that the monarchy needed, in his words, a bit of improvement. What's your take? Um, well, I think as Sean said uh, last week mm. when she was here, and, you know, she was quite bold. When everyone was not mm. saying anything, she s stood out and said, uh, yeah, questions need to be answered. I think that there are still questions that are unanswered. I don't think just uh, Andrew withdrawing from public life is a solution. The, the, the point here is the victims that are at the centre of this, uh, the survivors of abuse. No one should be above the questions. Uh, and these questions need to be put. And this is no substitute, no alternative. Uh, and then just finally, I read a recent interview you did with the Metro and a quote yeah. jumped out to me. You said, I didn't behave that well as a young person growing up. I was quite wild as a teen. Do you want to share a bit more <laughs> of what you're up to? Uh, well, I, I've always been a musician. I've uh, played in bands. Uh, and I mean, there's a, when I do gigs, I still play in a band. OK, this is not, a, uh, not word for word correct, but um, my front man, when he gets up on stage, he has to introduce who I am. And he says, you know, there was always a choice for Jonathan between politics uh, and the career in music. And when he found out how much sex and drugs there were in politics, <laughs> it's not true at all. Um, I've always been guided by my passion to change the world. Uh, and that's what that's what drives me. I was maybe overplaying the wild side a bit. Gave up the sex and drugs. Um, thank you very much for being on the programme today. Jonathan Bartley there.